It's 1946, post, and the celebration goes on and on. But Del Wiley is not toasting the end of the war, rather just surviving it and keeping a special promise. Once a year, every year, the Royal Order of the Rubber Rafters will follow their orders and take a drink on the anniversary of their liberation. Most were flyers shot down over the South Pacific, washed up near Choiseul Island, some 200 miles behind enemy lines. We were just looking for enemy ships and we found one. Wiley was in a torpedo bomber off the carrier Enterprise when his plane was shot down. We were making a bombing run when they caught us. We were setting ducks. He made it out alive, but deep in enemy waters, on a tiny raft with an horrific leg injury. No land in sight, just him and the sharks. Boy, I don't want him hanging around here, so yes, I shot him. And then the next day, there was maybe six or seven. And I thought, well, don't have that much ammunition. He drifted for two weeks. I've spoken to a lot of college kids, classes in high school. And every time they ask, did you pray? I says, yes. There ain't no atheists in rubber boats. Wiley lived six months on a remote island before being joined by more Allied flyers who had been shot down. They traveled by leaky canoe to Choiseul, the base for Coast Watchers Nick Waddell and Carton Seaton. They hadn't seen us coming from the lookout and he had sent some troops down to find out what the heck that was. And they stayed with us the rest of that night. Some natives asked what we were, and I was able to tell them we were Americans. Waddell gave Wiley and the other 22 flyers he saved membership in the ancient order of the rubber rafters of Choiseul. This was something that was put together as almost uh, an unofficial uh, award to recognise the fact that these guys had been uh, shot down, had been recovered with the assistance of the Coast Watchers. The rubber rafters were required to remember their rescue once a year by getting drunk. Given the proviso that when they got back safely, they were to get uh, horribly drunk and uh, <laughs> celebrate in true form. The fact that uh, levity was apparent, I think that that in itself is, is uniquely Australian. These days, Wiley and his family just drink water. We say to ourselves, we better have a good drink of water. Six decades after his rescue, Wiley still has a vivid memory of Seton and the man he called Sir Nick. Now Waddell and Seton were 18 months on Chorzell. That's a long time to have uh, Japanese breathing down your neck. Despite the dangers, Coast Watchers and their scouts went to extreme lengths to save Allied flyers. One of them was shot down behind the islands here. Yeah? The next day we paddled him back to Sege Point and the PB worker came and picked him up and then returned him to Godokuna. The Coast Watchers had turned the islanders against the Japanese and in many cases those islanders would kill Japanese pilots rather than return them. For the Allies, well, you bring that plane down and get into your little rubber raft and paddle to the nearest island, and some islanders are going to find you and take care of you and feed you, and then a Coast Watcher is going to get to you. Linda and Jeffrey Cooper saved several pilots shot down over Santa Isabel. Quite a few pilots, the, the, the people, people rescued them and bring them to us. One of the pilots badly shot once. We don't know what to do to keep us radio because he suffered very badly. We had no food, nothing on the, with us. So he sent a message and they said, if possible, try and bring him in because they can't take him out. So we moved by night. Scary. We went and as soon as we got there, when I look, he's already taken up. They put the stretcher down and <laughs> took him up. He was very badly hurt. The islanders were told that they would get a reward if they brought in down pilots. One airman, uh, Jefferson de Blanc, who would later earn the Medal of Honor, once told me that he had found out exactly what he was worth because his rescuers exchanged him for a bag of rice. Hey. 
one rescue in particular would have a profound impact on history. This is Aaron Kumana, Hello. one of the scouts that uh, saved John F. Kennedy, his, him and his partner Buku, and the last remaining survivor of the PT-109 rescue. August 1943, and the action has moved up the slot into Rendova and New Georgia with fast PT boats in the thick of things. Now, coast watcher Reg Evans, based on the volcanic island of Kilimbangara, will play his part in history as two of his scouts make a startling discovery. Aaron Kumani and Buku Gasa stumble on the shipwrecked crew of PT-109 and Lieutenant John F. Kennedy. Just as we were about to head home, we saw this big explosion. Commander Ted Robinson was on another boat alongside PT-109 on the night of the mission. We had hoped that Jack Kennedy, one of the destroyers in the lower part of the Blackett Strait had gotten a hit on the, and it was the magazine of a, of a Japanese destroyer going up. And we didn't find out till the next morning what had happened. And that was that a Japanese destroyer had rammed Kennedy. Robinson says when the group returned to their base at Rendova at daybreak, the 109 was gone. They even held a funeral for Kennedy and his crew. But most had survived, washed up on this tiny island. The original name of the island is called Casola, and that means gods of paradise. Danny Kennedy, no relation to Jack Kennedy, runs a dive shop in the Solomon Islands and has retold the PT-109 rescue story a thousand times. Kennedy's, uh, the, the PT boat was basically struck maybe five or six miles just east of the island here. There's a little area there called uh, Blackett Strait, and it was actually hit uh, by a Japanese destroyer in the Blackett Strait. It actually got hit just at about one o'clock, so it split. The torpedo tubes in the starboard side of the vessel went straight to the sea floor. The, the other part turned upside down, and what allowed them to drift for quite some time was is they clung onto the hull of the PT boat. Aaron Kumana and Buku Gasa, they were actually just um, pilfering what they believed was a Japanese barge that had washed up on the southern end of Nauru Island. And they saw Kennedy and those guys standing on, uh, on Nauru Island. And then they very quickly were quite scared. They thought they were Japanese and would see them. Kennedy told us he had a problem and asked if we could help. Came up with this idea and to, um, uh, to inscribe a coconut to, as a, a means of a message. They didn't have any paper or pencils at the time. And the reason they used a green coconut is because if the Japanese were to intercept them, they could actually eat it out and spoon it out and actually take the message away. Then Buku and Aaron paddled the messages down. When Kennedy had finished writing his message on the coconut, we paddled it to Nusaro, Vienna, where we told the coast watcher, Reg Evans, that Kennedy was on the island and needed a PT boat to come pick him up. But he told us to go back in our canoe and bring Kennedy to him. So that's what we did. Evans had been sending constant dispatches back to Rendova and Guadalcanal seeking rescue craft. So the message on the coconut was not unexpected. So how many does Kennedy have along with him? E Evans radioed back to our base and meanwhile they, uh, Lenny Tom had sent another note over to Evans and, and uh, we set up the rescue mission. And when they read the message, Reginald Evans said to these guys, you bring me the man that carved this coconut. So they paddled all the way back, took Kennedy inside their dugout canoe, laid him on the floor of the, the dugout canoe, covered him with a palm frond and paddled him down to Q Island. So we sneaked in at night in this cold and the signal was we were supposed to fire four shots from our 45. Once he heard those, he was supposed to fire one shot from his British Enfield rifle. And then he came out and made sure it was us alone, other natives, and then and only then did he lead us back through the islands and pick up his crew. Mission accomplished. The PT boats returned the surviving 109 crew to base. Robinson and Kennedy ended up sharing a tent while he recovered from his injuries. Robinson grabbed his camera, capturing the iconic photo of a recovering Lieutenant Kennedy on his cane. Many years later, Reg Evans would meet President Kennedy in the White House, presenting him with a painting of the rescue.
To this day, Aaron remembers Kennedy with a simple monument next to his home. I think he had profound respect for them. He would, they, they saved his life. Aaron and Buku were both invited to Washington for Kennedy's inauguration, asked to join the inaugural parade along with Kennedy's crew and a replica of PT-109. But government bureaucrats in the islands decided others should go in their place. Neither man saw Kennedy again. Just ahead, the other job of the Coast Watchers, so secret, few learned of it until long after the war. 